and welcome to episode 36 of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. My name is Steve Elliott. I am editor of ToqueSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First of all, let's take a look at our Toke Signals Bud Pick of the Week. This week, we have something a little different for you. This bud has already been broken up into a joint, and as you can see, it has some keef in there with it. This bud was from the strain Ghost, which is an Indica dominant, a quite good one. And interestingly enough, the keef sprinkled on this joint was completely free because I got it from stems that would otherwise have gone in the trash. If you want to do that yourself, get a keef box, save your stems, agitate those things for five minutes, and there's your free keef. Now let's do the news, shall we? In our first story of the week, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder said before Congress that it's unclear whether the federal government can force states to outlaw marijuana. Attorney General Holder on Tuesday appeared before the House Judiciary Committee for an oversight hearing, and at that hearing he stated that federal law does not always trump state law. He declined to initiate the process to reschedule marijuana, and he reaffirmed his commitment to granting clemency to low-level nonviolent drug offenders who get unduly harsh sentences. Under questioning by Representative Jason Smith, a Republican congressman from Missouri, who asked the Attorney General whether federal law trumps state law when the two were in conflict, Holder said that while federal law is supreme in many matters, it is an interesting question, quote unquote, whether the federal government can force a state to criminalize a particular behavior. I'm hopeful that as public opinion continues to shift in favor of marijuana reform, the White House will one day have the courage to take a larger role in the push to legalization, said Law Enforcement Against Prohibition Executive Director Major Neil Franklin. Until then, states remain the innovators, exercising their constitutionally protected police powers to lead the charge toward sensible change that at least the administration has the good sense to follow. Despite saying he was glad to work with Congress, if there is a desire to look at and re-examine how marijuana is scheduled late last week, Holder declined to commit to initiate the process to reschedule marijuana. Currently, cannabis is a Schedule I drug under the Uniform Control Substances Act. That classification means that it is viewed as having no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. It enacts a de facto ban on research on the effects and safety of cannabis. Representative Steve Cohen, a Democrat from Tennessee, pressed Holder on his reluctance to act to reschedule marijuana. Cohen cited Title 21 of the Controlled Substances Act, which allows the Attorney General to request the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do a scientific and medical review and make a scheduling recommendation based on scientific research rather than on politics. If the secretary were to recommend rescheduling, the attorney general could then initiate proceedings for its removal without congressional involvement. Congressman Cohen noted that Dr. Sanjay Gupta, chief medical correspondent for CNN, has said he believes in the ability of marijuana to treat conditions such as epilepsy and multiple sclerosis, and that more research should be conducted. While we have been encouraged by Attorney General Holder's comments surrounding more sensible marijuana policy, it's time he took substantial action to back up that rhetoric, added Lieutenant Commander Diane Goldstein. An offer to work with a Congress that last year passed the fewest bills in history on something he could easily do himself is not much of an offer, she said. Holder also confirmed his support for Deputy Attorney General James Cole's recent call to defense lawyers to help the government locate low-level, nonviolent drug prisoners and encourage them to apply for clemency. He said the Department of Justice was establishing a seven-person team, including four attorneys, who would review the cases of those in jail for life or near-life sentences, despite not being leaders of an operation or tied to cartels or gangs. The pendulum swung a little too far in the 80s, Holder commented, on the zeal to pass mandatory minimums and other determinate sentences in the wake of public fears of the crack ep epidemic of that time. These sentences were enacted in haste amid a climate of fear, Major Franklin said. 
Clemency is a start, but what we need is a fundamental reappraisal of how we approach drug use and abuse in this country. In 2010, Congress unanimously voted to reduce the 100 to 1 disparity between sentences for crack cocaine offenses and those for powdered cocaine that disproportionately targeted blacks because crack cocaine was more popular in black neighborhoods, while whites were more likely to use powdered cocaine. In December, eight federal inmates who received sentences under the old rules had their sentences commuted by President Obama. The Department of Justice is now looking for other inmates who were inappropriately sentenced. Finally, Representatives Gowdy and Labrador both called into question Holder's practice of writing memos guiding the prosecutors below him to avoid including weights on charge sheets so as to avoid triggering mandatory minimum laws. Instead, they urged him to work with Congress to expand safety valves. Holder countered by saying that the move was common sense and a reasonable use of prosecutorial discretion. In Washington State this week, the Suquamish tribe of Native Americans approached the state about marijuana sales. The Suquamish tribe of Washington State is exploring the idea of selling marijuana on their reservation at Port Madison, Washington. This Native American tribe proposed a deal with the Washington State Liquor Control Board earlier this year that would allow cannabis sales by the tribe and tribally approved businesses. The Liquor Board hasn't taken any formal action on the tribe's proposal, according to spokesman Brian Smith. Because the reservation is under federal rather than state jurisdiction and marijuana remains illegal under federal law, the Liquor Control Board will defer to the federal government on cannabis policies affecting the tribe, according to Smith. I would not expect us to issue any licenses without some defining statement from the Department of Justice, Smith said on Wednesday. Suquamish Chairman Leonard Forsman said the tribe hopes to discuss with the Liquor Control Board how they can become involved in legal marijuana sales. The tribe has a responsibility to explore business opportunities that may help raise funds for its people and government, Forsman said in a statement released to the media. The production and sale of marijuana on our tribal lands is simply something we are exploring and thought it vital to approach the Liquor Control Board as part of that process, Forsman said. The chairman noted that cannabis remains prohibited on the reservation under tribal law. Tribal representatives declined to elaborate on the plans beyond Forsman's statement. It's an interesting idea because it's another opportunity for tribes to assert their sovereignty through their own regulatory jurisdiction, according to Seattle attorney Carson Cooper, who specializes in Native American affairs. Under the proposal, marijuana businesses operated by the tribe would not be subject to the licensing procedure established under Initiative 502, the tightly controlled legalization measure approved by Washington voters in 2012, but under which no legal marijuana stores have yet opened. Cannabis stores operated by tribe members or other tribally approved operators would have to meet state licensing requirements, but they'd be exempt from some regulations, including applications deadlines, which have already passed. Tribal marijuana businesses also would not be subject to the 25% excise tax enacted by Washington State under the tribe's plan. That casts an interesting sidelight on the current debate in Washington over whether medical marijuana patient collectives, which operate as dispensaries, should be shut down. One argument advanced by state officials for shutting down the medicinal cannabis collectives is that since they aren't subject to the 25% excise tax, they would provide too much competition for the state licensed recreational marijuana stores. Some other tribes in Washington have taken a decidedly anti-marijuana position. The Yakima Nation of Central Washington have come out strongly against legal cannabis, banning possession and prohibiting sales on their tribal lands, and attempting to prevent the opening of stores for which business licenses have already been applied. The Yakima cite federal anti-marijuana laws under which cannabis is still a Schedule I controlled substance and have called upon federal authorities to prevent the implementation of I-502 on tribal lands. Port Gamble's Sklalem Tribe Chairman Jeremy Sullivan said cannabis is still illegal on the Sklalem Reservation, but the Tribal Council will probably take another look at marijuana laws in the future. Sullivan said the tribe is watching how other state tribes approach cannabis before addressing that issue locally. In South Carolina this week, a bit of good news. The South Carolina Democratic Party will ask voters 
on the June primary ballot whether they support legalizing medical marijuana in a non-binding referendum. Party leaders made the announcement to push a medical marijuana bill currently in the South Carolina legislature. House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford, a Democrat from Richland, who is sponsoring a medical marijuana bill in the legislature, said state Democrats are putting the question on the ballot so that Republicans who control the state house can see for themselves what voters think of the issue. Rutherford said patients who are authorized by a physician as suffering debilitating illnesses such as cancer and glaucoma should be able to use cannabis medicinally. While this may be the first year we're talking about medical marijuana in South Carolina, we are lagging behind the rest of the nation, Rutherford said during a Wednesday news conference. The advisory question on medical marijuana is one of five asked on South Carolina's Republican and Democratic primary ballots on June 10th. Two others on the Democratic ballot have to do with gambling. Republican voters, meanwhile, will be asked about abortion and eliminating the state income tax. Voters' response to primary ballot questions don't necessarily mean a law will be passed, but they are seen by party leaders as a way to get voters to the polls and to gauge popular sentiment on divisive issues. Meanwhile, supporters of a medical marijuana bill gathered at the South Carolina State House on Wednesday to call for the measure to be passed. It's just a shame that we have to break the law just to live, said former police officer Clint Jackson, who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. I've tried 12 different medicines, and my doctor, all she can tell me is, I've tried everything. There's nothing else that the medical community can do for me, and this is my last best hope. <clears throat> Ezra Kaiser is a two-year-old who has epilepsy, and medical marijuana has made a real difference in her life. You just can't imagine this tiny one-week-old baby having a grand mal seizure, and unfortunately it didn't get any better, her mother said. We went from hospital to hospital to hospital. In his first year of life, he was in the hospital 14 times, and nothing helped. Kaiser said her daughter had to move to Colorado to get Ezra properly treated. The boy's improving now, and she wants South Carolina lawmakers to pass Rutherford's bill, the Put Patients First Act, to pass in South Carolina. I would hope that they would not tell another parent, another grandparent, that they have to watch their child or grandchild suffer, Kaiser said. I can't imagine for anybody to tell them your grandchild needs to suffer or move to Colorado. That's just not what we should be about in South Carolina. Rutherford's bill would allow patients to possess up to two ounces of marijuana legally with authorization from a doctor. Patients would register with the State Department of Health and Environmental Control for a medical marijuana ID card. Farmers who grow medicinal cannabis would have to have a DHEC certification and a background check. This bill comes a week after the South Carolina House passed a bill allowing cannabis oil containing cannabidiol, CBD, to be used by those with severe epilepsy. Unfortunately, that bill, which has since been referred to the Committee on Medical Affairs, is so narrowly focused that it probably won't help any patients. It requires the approval of the FDA Apparently, these lawmakers didn't learn anything from the 1980 law, which was non-functional. The bill also doesn't allow tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, the most studied component of marijuana, which has been shown to have many medical benefits, including stopping tumor growth and reducing inflammation. Studies have shown that the cannabinoids work best in synergy with each other, and what Dr. Sanjay Gupta has called the entourage effect. Medical marijuana has been technically legal in South Carolina since 1980, but that law directed the DHEC to get and distribute marijuana without money or a plan for doing that, according to Rutherford. It also would have required the sign-off of federal authorities, which of course never happened. The current bill is running out of time to pass this year, since bills must pass in one body or the other of the legislature before May 1st in South Carolina to have a realistic chance of becoming law. But Rutherford said if his medical marijuana bill doesn't pass this year, Democrats will use the results of the referendum to push the legislation again next year. In New Hampshire this week, a new poll shows that a majority of Granite State adults support legalizing marijuana and regulating it like alcohol. The annual WMUR Granite State poll released on Wednesday by the University of New Hampshire Survey Center shows a growing majority of New Hampshire adults support making marijuana legal and regulating it like alcohol. The survey found 55% support 
making possession of small amounts of marijuana legal in New Hampshire, up from 53% in 2013, and 67%, two-thirds, approval of marijuana being sold in licensed retail outlets and taxed at levels similar to alcohol if marijuana possession becomes legal. Marijuana prohibition has been an ineffective and wasteful policy, according to Matt Simon, the Gosstown, New Hampshire-based New England political director for the Marijuana Policy Project. Voters are increasingly becoming fed up with it, Simon said, and they're ready to replace it with a more sensible system in which marijuana is regulated and taxed similarly to alcohol. The same poll also found that three out of five New Hampshire adults, 61%, support House Bill 1625. That's a measure approved by the State House of Representatives and now being considered by the State Senate that would reduce the penalty for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana to a $100 civil fine. Currently, possession of any amount of marijuana is a misdemeanor punishable by up to a year in prison and a fine of up to $2,000 in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is bringing up the rear in progressive marijuana policies in New England. The Granite State is the last in New England that still treats simple marijuana possession as a criminal offense with the potential for jail time. Using taxpayer dollars to criminalize people for marijuana possession is not a popular idea in New Hampshire, Simon said. How can anyone defend a law that subjects people to potentially life-altering criminal penalties simply for using a less harmful substance than alcohol? It's irrational, it's counterproductive, and it's time for it to change. In Massachusetts this week, the mayor of Boston said he's going to block medical marijuana dispensaries from opening. Boston Mayor Martin J. Walsh this week moved to block the opening of two medical marijuana dispensaries in that city, saying he's, quote, dead set against the shops at a forum in Dorchester, and then sending a letter to state officials urging swift action if any problems are found with the company's applications. I'm writing to express my serious concern regarding the two registered marijuana dispensary applicants in the city of Boston, the mayor wrote in a Tuesday letter addressed to Massachusetts Secretary of Health and Human Services John Polanowitz and to Executive Director Karen Van Unen of the state's medical marijuana program. Questions remain about the two companies, Mayor Walsh claimed. Green Heart Holistic Health and Pharmaceuticals, Inc. wants to open a 3,000-square-foot dispensary at 70 Southampton Street, and Good Chemistry of Massachusetts, Inc. plans a shop on Boylston Street. The mayor urged swift and uniform action if inaccuracies are found in the application, saying that would bolster confidence in the regulatory process. If any information provided in either application is confirmed to be inaccurate, I ask that the Department of Public Health immediately eliminate that application from being eligible for a final certification of registration, Mayor Walsh wrote. The letter followed public comments that the mayor made on Monday during a community presentation. Walsh said he is dead set against marijuana dispensaries, had long opposed medical marijuana, and would prevent dispensaries in Boston. I have made it very clear to the state that I don't want these dispensaries in our city, the mayor said to about 200 people at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, placing his personal opinions above the welfare of thousands of Boston patients. I'm dead set against legalizing marijuana, Mayor Walsh responded when asked by one person at the church how the city can reduce drug dealing and violence while also legalizing medicinal cannabis. I was dead set against the marijuana dispensaries and I was dead set against all the marijuana laws because they are dangerous, the dim-witted mayor said. The mayor claimed marijuana as a gateway, claiming he watched many of his friends who had started smoking weed go on to the hard stuff. You are going to work with us to make sure they don't get here, Reverend Miniard Culpepper, the church's pastor asked, looking straight at the mayor. Trust me, Mayor Walsh responded. You will be working with me to make sure they don't get here. The audience applauded. But analysts say the mayor will have a tough time blocking the shops. With the medical marijuana law establishing the dispensaries already approved by a large majority of Massachusetts voters and the regulatory process already underway, Mayor Walsh might be able to stall the shops opening by using zoning laws, but he has little power to permanently ban the dispensaries, according to Jeffrey M. Berry, a political science professor at Tufts University. I don't see a clear power to prevent these stores, Barry said, but certainly the thing the mayor can do is delay this and make their lives miserable. Under the medical marijuana law approved by Massachusetts voters in November 2012, the state can select 35 nonprofit companies to open cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts. 
The Department of Public Health in January gave preliminary approval for the first 20 of those to operate dispensaries, including two in Boston. Any delay causes needless suffering for patients, according to Matthew Allen, executive director of the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance. A more sensible and compassionate approach that eliminating the Boston applicants at this point would be for the city to work with its dispensary operators and community members to address concerns through ongoing collaboration, community engagement, and regulation, according to Allen. In Oregon this week, the grassroots cannabis campaign is continuing to gather signatures. Two cannabis legalization measures in Oregon are gathering signatures around the state. Initiative petitions 21 and 22. First is the Oregon Cannabis Amendment, and second is the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. They are both in the race for the July 3rd signature deadline. Initiative 21 would end criminal penalties for cannabis, while Initiative 22 regulates and taxes cannabis, including hemp for industrial and agricultural uses. The people of Oregon stand with Initiative 21 and 22, and they demonstrate this by getting involved, said campaign director Jersey Deutsch of the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp, CRRH. This is because our legislation puts an end to cannabis prohibition, ensuring no one in Oregon will be criminalized for cannabis again. Currently, CRRH has more than 20 staff members, 3,000 volunteers, and 6,000 independent Oregon donors, making them second only to Oregon United for Marriage, with the largest volunteer campaign in the state. Volunteers join our campaign because they believe we must put an end to prohibition and criminalization while ensuring citizens of all ages are free of cannabis-related felonies, Deutsch said. CRRH will continue the fight to end cannabis prohibition by mobilizing organ supporters, educating community members, fighting for patients, training and empowering volunteers, growing the campaign and pushing legislation forward. In Texas this week, a story, we have a woman who got put in jail after calling the cops to complain about some low quality marijuana she bought. There aren't many good options when you buy a bad sack of black market weed. As Evelyn Hamilton of Lufkin, Texas found out on Monday, calling the cops is one of the worst options. Lufkin police arrested Hamilton, 37 years old, after she called them to complain about some low-quality marijuana she had bought from her dealer. An officer went to Hamilton's home after she called the police, objecting that her cannabis was substandard. According to Lufkin Police Sergeant David Casper, when the officer asked if Evelyn still had the weed, she just pulled it out of her bra, according to Sergeant Casper, like she didn't have a care in the world. Hamilton told the officer that she had just spent $40 on seeds and residue. When she got no satisfaction from the dealer or his family, she said she called the cops. She was arrested on Friday on a charge of possession of drug paraphernalia. Before we go this week, we have a must-read story on toke signals. It's by my friend Jack Rikus, who happens to be a hell of a writer. He's very entertaining, and if you check out his story, Top 10 Things I Miss About Old School Weed Dealers, you're going to see exactly what I mean. I'm not saying Jack's old, but he goes back far enough in our culture to remember the old days. And he's got it pretty much spot on because I was there too. You want to check this story out. Top 10 things I miss about old school weed dealers. Hope you decide to join us again next week for the latest and greatest in cannabis and hemp news. Send in those bud picks and make your flowers famous. We'll include them on our bud pick of the week. And until we meet again, why don't you stay lifted? I'll see you next time.